One, two, how's the volume on that? All right, great. All right, well, welcome back. Thank you for your uh, continued presence and participation in, uh, in the workshop. My name is Kyle Moselle. I'm the executive director uh, of the Office of Project Management and Permitting, and that's in the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. I am based in Juneau. I've been there for a little over 20 years. Um, I have uh, enjoyed a, a great career with the state so far. And um, today's assignment is to uh, moderate and contribute to the conversation we have for this session, which is the um, fisheries and local water resource management issues. Um, and so today on the panel uh, with me, I have Commissioner Doug Vincent Lang from Department of Fish and Game, and I've got Commissioner Jason Bruni from Department of Environmental Conservation. So I think the, the approach we'll take for this panel here is that uh, I'll just wind these two gentlemen up and let them go. They really don't need too much uh, moderation. Um, and then I've got a few questions and we'll open it up to the crowd for, for questions or discussion. Um, and uh, how's that sound? Perfect. Okay, Doug, you wanna start okay. us off? Welcome to Alaska. I'm happy to share our great state with you and welcome the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Doug Vincent Lang and I'm the commissioner for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So let's get some energy in this room. What do you all wanna do when you come to Alaska? Catch a big ass fish, right? 300 pound halibut, 70 pound king salmon, that's what you wanna do. Let me begin by saying Alaska's fisheries are the best managed fisheries in the world. They not only feed our nation, and the world, but feed us Alaskans. They are also important culturally, forming a foundation of our diverse native cultures and their food security. Finally, they form a cornerstone of the economy of our state and our coastal communities, including Ketchikan, where we are today. Just look at the number of fishing vessels in these ports when you walk around Ketchikan. Our fisheries are an excellent example of responsibly managed, working, functional ecosystems that benefit communities. That's what we're talking about here today. Functional, working ecosystems that benefit communities. Alaska's commercial fisheries are the largest in the nation. Alaska produces 60% of the seafood harvested domestically in the United States. That's about six billion pounds annually, valued at nearly $2 billion. Alaska is home to the Bristol Bay sockeye fishery, the largest and most valuable salmon fishery in the world. And Alaska also has the nation's largest fishery by volume, pollock, in the Bering Sea. Several other species, including salmon, groundfish, and shellfish, contribute to the seafood sector. And the Alaska seafood industry creates an estimated 100,000 jobs, 5.2 billion in annual labor income, and 12.8 billion in economic output. Our fisheries also provide important sport fishing opportunities for residents and visitors to our state, many of whom feed their families with their catches. Economically, our sport fisheries support 16,000 jobs statewide, contribute $246 million in taxes to our state, $545 million in income, and $1.6 billion of industry output. Come on, who wouldn't rather be out in a boat today fishing? We all know fishing is better in the rain, right? And that's why God created Gore-Tex. And in Alaska, residents can harvest salmon and other fishery resources for their personal use. This is kind of unique. In Alaska, we have gill and dip net fisheries that Alaskan residents can participate in to fill their freezers to feed their families throughout the winter. Finally, our fisheries resources are important for subsistence, which in our state has a priority. Subsistence provides a nutritional replacement value that provides Alaskans with between 184 to 368 million dollars worth of wild food per year. And subsistence provides an important cultural identity to our native cultures. As I said earlier, our fisheries are the best managed in the world, and I mean that. Alaska has a constitutional mandate to manage our natural resources for their sustained yield. Let me quote our constitution. Fish, forest, wildlife, grasslands, and all other replenishable resources belonging to the state shall be utilized, developed, and maintained on the sustained yield principle, subject to preferences amongst beneficial uses. That's in our Constitution. 
That's not in a lot of other state constitutions. That's in Alaska's constitution. Statutorily from that constitution, I'm required to manage, protect, maintain, improve, and extend the fish, game, and aquatic plant resources of the state in the interest of the economy and general well-being of the state. And I took an oath in office to abide by those mandates in our constitution and statutes, and I take that oath of office seriously. Basically, we are required by our constitution and our state statutes to manage our fish and game resources for their long-term sustained yield and benefits. I might note that this differs significantly from federal mandates in my state, which are often focused on maintenance of natural diversity and where human use and economic benefit are really secondary considerations. In Alaska, about two-thirds of our state is under federal ownership, and these mandates mean that most of Alaska is not managed for economic benefit, rather for its natural diversity. Alaska believes we can have responsible resource development and that we have a demonstrated history towards this end. Alaskans care deeply about our lands and our waters, and as a result, Alaska has laws in place to ensure for the conservation of our fisheries resources. With respect to habitat, I have the authority to permit all activities that occur in streams that support anadromous fish, salmon, across our state to ensure that projects that might affect these water bodies are done in a manner that protects our fisheries. This is unique in our country, a state fish and game agency that has permitting authority over activities potentially impacting fishery resources. As a result, and the fact that much of our freshwater habitat is in some type of conservation status, means our freshwater habitats are conserved and regulated to ensure that as lands are developed, salmon habitat is conserved. And our water quality is protected by Jason. He's charged with regulating water quality to ensure that our fisheries resources are sustained. As a result, we have great water quality, and water quality is largely a concern that I do not need to worry about. We are also working bilaterally with Canada to address water quality issues in our transboundary rivers from mining activities in Canada. As a result of our efforts, all of our waters originating from Canada meet Alaska water quality guidelines. All in all, Alaska is proud of its regulatory oversight and is confident that we can sustainably manage our fisheries resources for their long-term sustained yield, and I'll add, benefit. As I said, Alaskans care about our resources. We know what it takes to sustain them and we know how important they are to us. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And my name is Jason Bruni. I'm here again. I was in an earlier panel. Uh, I'm the commissioner of the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. And today's obviously Working Lands, Working Communities workshop is just that. It's a workshop. But I'll tell you, Doug and I and uh, the commissioner of natural resources, we have we work together on a daily basis. Our teams are constantly communicating and collaborating. Kyle Moselle uh, oversees the uh, Office of Management, Planning, and Permitting. I think I got that right. Close. Permitting and planning, whatever it is. OPUMP is what we call it. And, <laughs> and cons uh, collaborates with all of the uh, uh, departments to ensure that when projects are going forward that we're talking to each other, that we understand the impacts on the water quality, on air quality, on fish. And so we think about these things before these projects go forward. Those kind of workshops, the model that we have obviously for Western states hopefully, hopefully might be a model for each of you to consider. As we're talking about workshops, though, I think it's important when we're thinking of the, the federal policies that are going to impact all the Western states, indeed all of the United States, uh, that we're hearing about, um, you need to understand a little bit about Alaska. And so I, I put a few slides together that just shows uh, something about Alaska so that you can understand. Obviously, a lot of the Western states have a lot of federal ownership. Well, Alaska is uh, very, very high up there. Let me see if I can get these slides to advance. You're using the laser pointer. I wish I was using the laser pointer. <laughs> There we go. So I don't know if you've ever seen a map of the United States of America. This is the, the where, where is Alaska usually in that map of the United States of America? In a, like a little, little <laughs> left corner. We're the, what, the furthest southwestern state uh, is usually where it appears on your maps. This is the map you all should be using. 
United States of America, and in the lower right corner, you'll see the lower 48 and Hawaii in a, in a little box. It's actually not, not uh, too off. Uh, so you look at, at the state of Alaska. This is the ownership uh, of the state of Alaska. And what you'll see is real easy, a million acres for every day of the year. There's 365 million acres in Alaska. Over 200 million acres of Alaska is in federal ownership. State of Alaska, through our statehood compact, also had 104 and a half million acres. And we selected those lands because we were allowed to become a state because of our rich natural resources. We selected those lands for their resource potential. As I talked about earlier today, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which was passed 50 years ago, that extinguished Aboriginal land rights and claims for 44 and a half million acres. And so when you look at Alaska, less than one half of 1% of Alaska is in conventional private ownership. Of that, when, when we're talking about the 30 by 30 plan, uh, conserving 30% of uh, every state's lands I've heard about, well, uh, Alaska has 148 million acres of conservation system units in the state. Do the math, 10% of uh, 30, 365 million acres is 36.5 million. You add that together and you get, I don't know, 110, 115 million. We're way over 30% already. So we love 30 by 30. We plan on giving back around 30 million acres of conservation system units. And uh, my, my friend Kip Knudsen said that 30 by 30 east of the Mississippi is what we should be focusing on. Because I guarantee you, most of us Western states already have a significant amount of our lands already conserved. State of Alaska, 80% of our nation's wildlife refuge acreage, 70% of our national park lands. And by the way, we have the two largest national forests the Tongass, which is right in our backyard here in Ketchikan, and the Chugach. Those two large national forests are managed like national parks. There is zero ASQ coming from the second largest national uh, forest, the Chugach. And there's less than 50 million board feet coming a year from the Tongass. So while you see we have 148 million acres of conservation system units in the state, we actually have a hell of a lot more than that. And of course, capital W wilderness, that's lands that will never be touched. We have well over half of the nation's federally designated capital W wilderness. We're doing our part to conserve Alaska. In Alaska also, you know, you hear Minnesota brag about being the land of 10,000 lakes. We're the land of 3 million lakes. We have a, a thousand miles of river for every day of the year, 365,000 miles of river, and we have more coastline than the rest of the United States combined. We talk about wetlands and the waters of the United States. We hear about all, all about that and the impact that that's going to have on Alaska. Well, Alaska has 175 million acres of wetlands. Lower 48 at one time had 200 million acres of wetlands. Half of that has already been developed. We've developed less than one half of 1% of our wetlands in Alaska. So when you're thinking perspective, when you're thinking conservation, when you're thinking about what this panel is about, focusing on water and how we make sure we have the best fisheries in the nation and we conserve our water and we make sure the wetlands benefits are there, we're doing a damn good job of it in Alaska. Non, uh, marine sanctuary type of designations also come in uh, the names of critical habitat. So we have a bunch of what are called charismatic megafauna. They're, these are the animals that everyone just loves. They're cute, they're snuggly, you know, like you can snuggle up to a nice polar bear. Uh, these have been obviously designated as endangered under either, uh, or under the Endangered Species Act. And you see all of this uh, uh, water off of the coast of Alaska designated by uh, the either National Marine Fisheries Service or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as critical habitat. This does not include uh, what NOAA calls essential fish habitat, which if you were to look at the state of Alaska, it's almost every single river uh, in the state of Alaska is essential fish habitat. And if you've seen the movie The Incredibles, when everything is special, then nothing is. And in Alaska, everything is essential fish habitat. And here, everything is critical habitat for these endangered species. So one of the things that Governor Dunleavy obviously has been very focused on is the fact that Alaska is open for business 
and that the development of our natural resources, the development of our fishery resources, our mineral, our timber, and protection of the environment, those two things are not mutually exclusive. We've proven in the state that these things can coexist and we use the timely science-based permitting uh, process that the Department of Fish and Game, the Department of Natural Resources, and DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, work collaboratively together to ensure that we have uh, that we're protecting our natural environment. We also work very closely to make sure that we engage with the uh, indigenous people, uh, the Alaska Native corporations, the businesses that, that uh, call Alaska home to make sure that we're talking about these and planning these projects uh, and the fisheries development, you name it, in this state uh, on an ongoing basis. As Doug mentioned, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council is the model worldwide for how fisheries development should be occurring. When we talk about uh, the relationship we have with the federal government, we like to say, at least at DEC, our relationship with the Environmental Protection Agency is one of cooperative federalism. This is where they set the standards at the federal level and then the states, if they have primacy of these programs, are charged with implementing them. And this is a, di obviously this is a great little graphic that talks about dual federalism versus cooperative federalism. We obviously want to make sure with our relationship with the EPA when we're talking about water resources that we work collaboratively, cooperatively. We are not told by a federal agency that um, we don't trust you to protect your own waters. To me, that's insulting. As the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation for the EPA to come out as they have with the new WOTUS rulings, saying that 800 projects nationwide were, didn't get permits. To say that you have to get a permit to, to say that you're going to protect the water, is insulting. We have state permits. We don't necessarily need federal permits. And we want to make sure that the EPA knows that we're going to take care of our own backyard better than anyone from the state of Washington or Washington DC is going to do. So with that, I just wanted to end uh, my opening remarks by saying yes, it is true that if you cut Alaska in half, Texas becomes the third largest state. So um, I'll just leave it at that, Kyle. Well, neither of you disappointed. I appreciate that. Um, and on that last note there, Jason, um, you know, if you just take that uh, conservation uh, acreage that you mentioned, what, 148 million acres, um, that's, that too would just become the, the third largest state, basically. Um, so just in the conservation area, you could have a, a second state I think Texas just beats it out a little bit, but that's it's incredible volumes. It's hard to actually put that um, area in in a mental picture for for yourself. So I am going to uh, ask a couple probing questions, um, and we'll see where this goes. So one of the interest areas for the workshop is the interdependent relationships between Western communities and states and federal resource management entities. Uh, can you share your perspectives on your relationship with uh, federal resource agencies or other uh, Western states, those communities that, that this workshop is, is kind of going out to? Okay, so let's talk about NIMS a little bit. So we have a really good working relationship with NIMS on on management of fisheries in, in the federal waters of the EZ off Alaska. We, we cooperate on, on putting together management plans and sustainably managing those fisheries for economic benefit for Alaska coastal communities in the state of Alaska. However, we don't have such a good working relationship with them, with them when they're doing their protected resources in terms of designating critical habitat off the state of Alaska, nor with them doing things like 30 by 30 initiatives, which really says, when I talked to them last time, we really don't have any marine protected areas in Alaska, so we'd like to have one up there someplace. We don't think you just need to check off a list to pre conserve Alaska. I think we're doing a fairly good job of conserving our waters. Just look at the numbers I talked to you about economically in terms of the value of fisheries across our great state. Yeah, sure, there's bad years and good years, but all in all, fisheries are a major contributor to the economy and they feed the nation and feed our people. What we need from the federal government is, is cooperation with us rather than a top-down level effect, which is what we're seeing in many cases. So, for instance, with 
a changing marine environment. We don't know what's happening beyond about three miles out to 200 miles out with a lot of salmon resources. I would like them to basically spend more time with us cooperating with what, what can be done in the ocean. What, what kind of information can we collect in the ocean to better assess what's happening to salmon during their time spent out in the ocean? rather than creating a marine sanctuary, which really doesn't answer the fundamental question of what's happening out there. So at the end of the day, we'd like them to cooperate with us more in collecting the baseline data and less so in developing regulatory oversight that has really very little benefit in terms of conservation. Ditto. Uh, when, when it comes to the Environmental Protection Agency, who we work very closely with, we both have the same mission, protecting human health and the environment. That said, there is the perception, as I mentioned in my previous comments, that Big Brother needs to come in and tell us how to do it. We obviously don't agree with that. We care more about our waters and our lands than Washington, D.C. does. So when we have the federal government coming in with preemptive vetoes of our permitting process for projects in the state on lands that were selected for their resource potential, that sends a chilling message from the federal government on state of Alaska lands. So this is one where I think Doug hit the nail on the head. We, we absolutely uh, want to work with them, but we don't need them um, dictating to us uh, how to take care of our own lands. We know how to do it better than anyone. So I'm gonna riff off of that question because you're, you're, both of your answers got me thinking when when we or federal agencies or other states use the term conserve conservation do we mean the same thing and if we don't what do we mean in Alaska when we say or talk about conservation well conservation is wise use it's not wise use. protection um, I think most often federal agencies think of the word conservation as protectionism and we don't think that. We think that we can conserve landscapes, we can responsibly manage them for economic benefit and output, and at the same time, conserve the functionality of those ecosystems. We're, the Endangered Species Act is a really interesting federal law. It basically says that you're gonna have the same ecosystem you had in 1972 forever into the future. You're never gonna change. Well, how does that really mesh with climate change? Are you gonna have some, there's gonna be changes in ecosystems. Evolution is based on changing ecosystems at, at a fundamental level. What we really want to have is functional ecosystems that are providing some benefits that humans can live in. You don't want to basically have just natural diversity in the landscape. We have that. We have national parks in Alaska. We don't disagree with that. But most of the other lands should be utilized in terms of some functionality and some benefit that's, that's moving forward to providing sustainability for our state. And our state was founded on a compact that said, we should develop our resources to pay our own way. That was a foundation of our Constitution. And at the end of the day, that's being stripped away from us by this increasing federal intrusion as to how we can plot our own future moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, the, the way the federal government interprets conservation is as little touching the land as possible we have a different interpretation of that in the state of Alaska. And we've proven that we can maintain the natural state of those lands without um, having to have zero access, zero use of that land. That's just, it's not, we're, we're gonna agree to disagree with the federal government on that. Okay. <clears throat> I was listening, so I hadn't prepared where, which question I was gonna go to next. Um, Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, leveraging relationships. So I'm, I'm kind of building from the last question here. Um, you know, let's take fish and game as, as recognized world leaders in sustainable fisheries management, but you don't do that all on your own, right? And so how, do you, how does fish and game, Doug, uh, leverage its relationships with with other states and federal or tribal agencies, but also local communities and resource users. I think that's a really unique aspect of of your management mission, and and I think 
it's not by accident. There, you can probably rattle off a number of, of uh, mechanisms that operationalize that through the relationships. And, and I'm want, hoping you can spend a little bit of time talking to that. So Alaska has got a unique regulatory structure for fisheries and wildlife management. Our system is based on a board of fisheries and board of game that's basically in charge of defining beneficial uses of resources, the allocation between those resources. I manage to their decisions, but I also manage to make sure that there's sustainability at the bottom of it. We're the biological experts. They're the allocation experts. And they base their decisions based on advisory committees. We have 78 of those around the state all built on local users and subsistence users, native people, whoever. They're all advising the, the Board of Fish and Board of Game on how they're going to make decisions in terms of the wisest use of those resources. From that, you know, those we have input and buy-in from all levels of the public across our great state. And let me tell you, I, I, in this job, one thing that never ceases to amaze me is the amount people care about fish and game in this state. Sometimes I wish they expressed it a little differently, but at the <laughs> fundamental level, I'm really glad that they care because I could be in, I could be a commissioner in other states or a director in other state of a fish and game agency and nobody really cares and that would be a bad situation. In Alaska, people care fundamentally about these resources and they're engaged. And our system is built to ensure that they have a voice in our management. Well, since this question was aimed at fish and game, I'll just say that you're right, Alaskans care, but it's not just Alaskans that care. It's folks that live in each of your states that care about Alaska. Uh, it's amazing. You don't find people in Washington that necessarily care about someone in South Dakota, but someone in California, Washington, Oregon, New York, Florida, they care about Alaska. So it's interesting. Uh, people love to protect Alaska from themselves, and meanwhile, don't hold themselves to that same environmental ethic that, that, we, ha that we have here. So I, I wish people cared more about their own backyard than our backyard. Okay. Well, let's give you a, a specific question here, Jason. Um, uh, Alaska's water quality standards are, are protective of all uses. I think I've, I've had you, or you've said that previously. Um, can you maybe talk about some of the programs that uh, ensure water quality um, in rural areas? Um, one of the ones that comes to my mind is the um, uh, Village uh, Safe, water. Safe Water and a couple other programs. And I, because I think that DEC has some really unique um, programs that are available to ensure that uh, every community in Alaska has access to clean water. And, and so I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about that because I think it's really unique for your Sure, department. thanks, Kyle. You know, as I showed you that map on the 365 million acres of Alaska, there's a lot of rural villages that aren't connected. We don't have the infrastructure that many of you in the lower 48 have. And so getting water systems, clean drinking water, uh, wastewater uh, systems in those communities is very expensive and it's cold. It's very difficult to maintain. In Alaska, amazingly, we still have 30 communities that are unserved. 30 communities that don't have safe drinking water or wastewater. Many of those communities, they use what are called honey buckets. This isn't the third world, this is Alaska. They have a five gallon bucket they get from Home Depot, they put a toilet seat on it, they put a bag in it, they use it, they fill it up and then uh, after a couple of weeks they put it outside and they leave the bag, it freezes and they, they either dispose of it in their sewage lagoons um, or they don't. They just dump it out, I mean, depending on the community that you're in. And so this is a program that DEC is very much focused on, especially in the pandemic. We need to make sure that, of course, washing your hands and clean sanitation is incredibly important. So we're, uh, we work on a regular basis with these communities to try to upgrade them. We get a lot of federal money uh, from the EPA um, for upgrading those systems and installing those systems. But again, they're expensive. And Kyle, one of the things that's really difficult is training the people from those communities to
to be able to support those systems. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to bring in people from Anchorage or Seattle or Fairbanks or Juneau to be able to maintain them. You want the people that live in those communities to have that expertise. And that's oftentimes very difficult. Um, so uh, we, I think that probably the heroes in my mind of, of DEC and in fact the state of Alaska are what are called remote maintenance workers. We have about 20 of them that go from community to community in the winter um, when the pipes freeze or when the generators aren't working and they have to clean those out and they have to make it so the community can get safe drinking water and can get their sewage piped to their sewage lagoon uh, for treatment. So it's, it is a, Alaska's different there. Uh, and it's, it's something obviously we're trying to modernize that, but it's, it's uh, the, the final thing I'll say is the average house in those 30 communities that are unserved in order to get them onto piped water, the average cost is $750,000 per house. Many of those houses aren't worth half that. I mean, obviously getting stuff to rural Alaska costs a lot, so they're worth a lot just from having uh, to ship that, but it's very expensive to do and it's very expensive to maintain. So that's, that's a, it's an issue that we're dealing with on a regular basis, but people recognize they eat the fish, the other subsistence resources from the areas where they are using the bathroom. So we need to make sure we have a, a system that keeps that away from their subsistence resources, that keeps that away from and, and keeps them safe. Excellent. Uh, Troy, you wanna give a, do a check for questions or should I just keep going? Oh, no, we could, there, there's plenty of questions we can ask you guys. Um, any from in, in the room? Okay. Oh, come One on. One of the things I want to <laughs> touch on, and, and I can't remember, I think it was Doug raised it uh, in your comments, was the relationship with Canada and with transboundary water flows. So did, talk to me a little bit about how that works how does that work? Is it effective? And then I'll throw a follow-up on that. Yeah. Well, that, that's a very good example where the state of Alaska is fully capable of resolving water quality issues with our transboundary rivers with our Canadian partners. We do not need the federal government to step in. We certainly don't need those issues resolved between Washington, D.C., and Ottawa. We need them resolved at the most local level, which is between the state of Alaska and British Columbia. So we have open... We have a compact with, with the, I don't know if it's a compact, but it's, a, it's an agreement with the British Columbia government to talk through the issues on, on transboundary rivers, especially with the mines that occur on their side of the border, because they've been a concern to users on our side of the border. So we have open, frank, candid discussions about what the issues are, and we've worked for a resolution. For instance, one of the main issues with Canadian mining was that, unlike Alaska, where we have bonding requirements up front, to ensure that if a mine closes, it can be restored and cleaned up. That wasn't the case in the Canadian side of the border. We've resolved that, and they now have bonding requirements on the front end of it. There's a long-standing mine that's, that was um, abandoned many years ago, Telshkal Chief Mine on the Taku River. That's been a concern for people in Alaska for, for years. We now have a commitment from the Canadian government to basically clean that mine up and move forward with it. And we also have joint water quality sampling where they've agreed that they would meet the water quality standards moving into Alaska. So we can solve these issues as the state of Alaska. We care about the water quality running down those rivers. They're coming into our, into our state, and we're big enough that we can talk to them and, and, and reach agreement with them. And Jason's the chair of the group, so I'll let him add to this one. All right, you answered it perfectly. I mean, but the other thing that's great is their scientists and our scientists work together. We do water quality uh, sampling as well as fish sampling and fish tissue sampling collaboratively. We look at it together and we realize that the impacts uh, from these are not yet seen in Alaskan waters, but we've also gotten baseline data because there are new mines being contemplated. It's so important to have that baseline data so you can understand uh, 20 years from now, what was it 20 years ago? 
And you can also see, are there impacts from climate change? Are there impacts because maybe it's not mining that's actually impacting it? We have mines around the state of Alaska that, that, that Red Dog exactly where because of climate change, we're seeing more natural seepage, more natural mineralization in the water it has nothing to do with the mining. It has to do with climate change. So uh, anyway, our relationship with uh, the BC government is very good. We had a meeting last week where we talked about a lot of these issues. We had a public meeting in May. Uh, Kyle oversees the, our relationship uh, as well. So he's working with them on a daily basis, or maybe not daily, but on a weekly basis about the projects that they're contemplating. And actually, I'm going to throw this back at you, Kyle. Why don't you talk about um, what you do from OPUMP's perspective, uh, collaborating with uh, the Canadian government on, on their projects? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, Troy, I think this is a really interesting question. It wasn't really one I had, I had thought of, but here's yet another thing that makes Alaska unique, right? We, uh, at least all, on all, along our land mass, we don't border another U.S. state. We border Canada. Um, and so if we... In at, Russia. In Russia. <laughs> I can see it from our house. Oh, my God. Um, uh, it, it, we can enter into uh, a relationship with uh, the province of British Columbia to seek mutually beneficial outcomes um, on resource issues, then I would hope that neighboring Western states could do the same thing. Now, uh, before I get into a little bit of the answer here, I do want to recognize that we're not the only U.S. state that borders British Columbia. You've got Washington, Idaho, Montana. And, and I think each state has its own unique um, issues as being a neighbor um, to, to British Columbia. And so I don't want to suggest that, that our approach or our issues uh, are um, directly relatable to another state, but I do know that there are uh, entities out there that want to lump us all together, that want to talk about uh, Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Alaska as having the same transboundary experience with BC. And I'm, I'm kind of here to tell you that I don't, that's not what I see from my vantage point. We've worked really hard to cultivate a productive working relationship with British Columbia. And I think the key is, is trust um, and acknowledging that they have uh, uh, jurisdictional authority over things happening in their border, and we have jurisdictional authority about things happening in our border. But the fact of the matter is the water flows from them to us, so we are interested in what's happening there. Um, but we don't come in as, um, you need to do X, Y, Z because we are telling you to. We, we seek to understand, we seek to engage, um, and then we find ways within their own existing laws in BC to affect an outcome that meets our needs. And that's what Jason was getting at, and that's kind of what I do, is we plug into their environmental review process and their permitting process. So through the memorandum of under, understanding we've signed with BC, we have a seat at that table. And we uh, put forward our technical experts into that process so that we can have a science-based uh, uh, input into their system, uh, their administrative system. And that then results in enforceable conditions placed on mining, or, or other uh, development activities that are regulated by BC. And that's where the enforcement of our interest comes. A lot of people like to point out that the MOU is, is just a handshake agreement between the two governments and there's no teeth to it. The, we don't need teeth in the MOU. BC has, has perfectly adequate laws uh, to ensure that, that, uh, that uh, responsible resource development can occur, and, and we just rely on those laws. And I would hope that they would do the same when the day comes where there's something that we reciprocate back, because it is a reciprocal agreement, but the focus really is around um, water quality, which just happens to flow our direction. So another example is one of the other hats I wear is I'm the Commissioner of Pacific Salmon Treaty. So yep. there's three U.S. commissioners, and in this case, there is obligations on both sides of the borders. We're, we're taking fish that are moving up into Canada. But I can tell you the strongest thing that drives us to reach agreeable solutions is the fear that we're going, if we don't reach them, it's going to be punted back to Ottawa and Washington, D.C. Whenever we reach a impasse, we remind ourselves of that and we resolve it as locally as possible. And on, on the part of the Canadians, the, the, the relationship is, is between you guys and BC. 
and the provincial and the Yukon, the other big chunk of Alaska Yukon. borders okay. the Yukon. On the and Treaty, is yeah. the Canadian federal government involved in with that at all? I would say that I mean, so there's something called the International Joint Commission that uh, we they have come and held meetings in Alaska, uh, but we have done, as Doug said, everything in our power to let them know that. The governments of BC and Alaska got this. We don't need the IJC's involvement to solve our problems. Uh, in the environmental review process uh, and permitting, the fed federal Canadian agencies are invited into that process as well, as well as the um, uh, Canadian First Nations. So they really do have a what they call a harmonized uh, environmental review process, and. You know, I, I think the other thing I wanted to get into in this session is is around permitting and, and um, uh, permitting streamline that has come up a few times already today. And I think British Columbia should at least be looked at as a case study because I think they have some really interesting approaches to their environmental review process that um, differ significantly from the National Environmental Policy Act that we have here um, in the U.S. And, and we utilize in Alaska. There's a few western states that have their own environmental review laws, but uh, NEPA is the, the crown jewel there. And I think when we talk about predictability or uncertainty uh, in a permitting process, and I think most people consider the, the NEPA process, the federal environmental review process in the U.S., uh, to be part of permitting, um, that uncertainty often comes from the fact that you as an applicant, from an applicant's vantage point, you put forward a proposal, and you might spend years developing that proposal, and and then you put forward that proposal, that application to the federal agency, and then you, that triggers NEPA. From that point on, it's like Jesus take the wheel. Um, it, it just goes through that process, and there's no real um, guarantees uh, about that. And, but what you are guaranteed to have is alternatives to your proposal that then get reviewed, and, and there's a whole process that goes, well, British Columbia, they front load that where they're, before they can even start the environmental review process, they have to show engagement, they have to have stakeholder engagements, they have to bring everybody to the table, and they, they review the proposal from a standpoint of should this enter the process, but once it does get the green light and enters the review process, it's 180 days. And so I've heard a lot over the years about, about why can't there just be a set period of time, like the agencies have X amount of days to process the application. And our laws at the state level and federal level in the U.S. just really aren't written that way. It's a bit of an open-ended box, and it's very iterative, too. So I think BC has has some things that we should look at as as a case study and, and observe those and and ask ourselves is there something we can take from them I'm a big proponent of of stealing good ideas um, and so anyway that's my piece on that. In fairness, I think NEPA says 300 pages <laughs> is the max, and so that was what what. Statutorily, NEPA is supposed to only, uh, an EIS is supposed to only be 300 pages. So the way agencies get around that is they have a 300 page NEPA document with a 4,822 page appendix. That's not what the intent of NEPA was. NEPA also has timelines built into it and those don't seem to be followed either, but I've digressed. But to balance that um, perspective, uh, the um, you like them longer? The, no, the FIPSI, uh, FIPSI, F uh, Federal, somebody help me with the acronym. Yes, Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Committee, FIPSI, that FAST 41 process. What's that, what that's trying to do is very much what my office does, which is bring all of, on the federal side, FIPSI, bring all the federal regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction over a proposed action and improve the communication between those agencies and keep the, uh, the process Moving. defined within a two-year period. So that um, is permit streamlining, and, and I think it's in action. That's, that's permit streamlining in action, and I think that that has been a good move predominantly. Um, and so I think that the federal government should look at those types of, of opportunities of, of synergies around resources. 
when they're looking at, at streamlining. And I think the state can do the same thing. So I don't know if we're wrapping up here, but I gotta, I gotta talk a little bit about the Endangered Species Act. So that's a piece of legislation that is being misused in our state. So the National Marine Fishery Service recently listed, or about five years ago, listed ring seals as an endangered species. So let me ask you, what do you how many ring seals do you think there are in the world? 10,000, 2,000? They list, these are listed now as a, under the Endangered Species Act. 1,500. There is between three and seven million of them. The federal government listed these as an endangered species. Their own modeling showed that there's not going to be any significant population impact to ring seals for the next 70 years. Sometime 70 to 100 years into the future, there might be a change. But because there might be a change sometime 70 to 100 years into the future, we need to list them today. That was followed immediately by a decision to designate critical habitat. Basically, any place a ring seal might swim in the state of Alaska has been designated as critical habitat despite the fact the primary constituent element is ice. So it's critical habitat whether there's ice or not because critical habitat is geographically found. I argue at the end of the day, that's unnecessary federal oversight and an unnecessary federal intrusion into our management. Seals are well managed now. They're gonna be well managed for the next 70 years. There is no need for the federal government to come in and overlay their authority on top of that species and on top of the landscape it occupies. Another example is what's happening in Anwar. You know, we we have four, four or five major caribou herds in the North Slope of Alaska. We have produced oil out of Prudhoe Bay for the last 40 years. Yep. We have not significantly harmed any of our caribou herds. As a matter of fact, they've coexisted. They're as healthy now as they were at the time when we developed those oil and gas resources. Now, fast forward over to Anwar, we're talking about protecting caribou is one of the primary issues against Anwar development. Most of the time you'd have any kind of exploration in Anwar is in the wintertime. Caribou are nowhere near that 1002 area. That's the coastal area. They're up against the mountains in the wintertime. We can responsibly manage oil and gas based on the experience we have in, in Prudhoe Bay just as easily in Anwar. We do not need Anwar to be federally designated wilderness land. Congress clearly articulated Anwar had oil and gas potential in the 1002 area, and we, Alaska can responsibly manage that resource to ensure that we preserve or conserve caribou for not only existing uses, but for their long-term sustainability. All right. Amen. Good thing for these mic stands, because that was a mic drop. <laughs> Well, you're not done yet. You've got 10 minutes left, and we are going to get you out of here at 4 o'clock so you can get to the airport. So, um, unless there's, do you have more oh, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, w I just wanted to leave a minute or two at the end for you to, to talk about maybe what priorities the, uh, the governors and this association should take away from this session sure. as our final point. So, we'll end yeah. on that. Okay. And the, but one question is kind of a follow up to, well, I, I want to get, since well, we were talking about shoulders. fisheries and water resources, <laughs> one question that, that I do want to get an answer to is, so from your, from your experience, if I'm, if I'm somebody down in lower 48 and worried about threats to uh, the seafood that I eat that comes from Alaska, mm -hmm. from a water quality standpoint, uh, what are those biggest? What are the biggest threats to the to the safety of that of that resource? I don't see threats to the safety of that resource. We manage our water in the state of Alaska for all uses. Certain states might use a certain water body for swimming and another one for fishing and another one for drinking water. We manage our water in the state of Alaska for all uses. So if there are impacts, we obviously make sure that those are taken into account during the permitting process. The biggest threat I would see to the f fish that people would be eating is not coming from the state of Alaska. 
might be the processing that occurs elsewhere or the transporting it or how they cooked it. But I'm, I'm confident that the projects that we have in this state, we have proven can coexist with our fisheries resources. We have offshore oil platforms in Cook Inlet where they harvest fish. We have, uh, there, there's examples, countless examples where we have shown that our fisheries resources can coexist. The Bristol Bay fishery had its largest fishery numbers ever this year. And that, that's fantastic. So I'm, I'm confident with the process that we have in place for permitting projects that our fisheries resources will maintain their safety for generations to come. And your food quality testing. Well, I, absolutely. Yep, we, we oversee uh, uh, food safety at DEC as well. And so we, of course, are making sure that we're regularly testing them. Um, about a decade ago, Fukushima occurred. Um, we test our fish on a regular basis to see if there's any radionucleotides. We've yet to see any. We know that there's concern with uh, Japan potentially uh, putting out the water in the next year or two. So we are going to be doing more testing from a baseline perspective. But we haven't seen any impact uh, from Fukushima. Uh, we, of course, uh, also are paying attention to the sewage discharges from local communities and what the people eat and where where harvest subsistence resources are being used we want to make sure that if there are areas from local community sewage impacts that are being impacted that we close those beaches down and that does happen in in fact in this community in ketchikan it happens every summer uh, we close beaches down where where harvesting occurs because of uh primary discharge um, Ketchikan is one of few communities left in the United States that has uh, a 301H waiver from the Clean Water Act. They can effectively skim off the top and let the things sink to the bottom and discharge the rest. Uh, the EPA gave them a 301H waiver in the 70s um, from the Clean Water Act. So we make sure that we're testing on a regular basis the the, the beaches and the 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 subsistence food that people are eating to ensure that it's safe. Thank you, Doug. And maybe one last one for uh, primarily Doug. Um, the, you talked a little bit about uh, how land use, federal land use designation, federal designations can affect your ability to manage fish and wildlife populations that, that are the states to manage. And so what recourse, what mechanisms are there for you to have discussions with those federal agencies that are, that are implementing that to, to make your points on, hey, you're, you're interfering with our ability to manage our resources? Well, there's two questions there. One is states are given primacy over fishing game. Right? all across our nation. And our federal government seems to think that they have primacy because and they have some responsibilities over federal subsistence. But that still doesn't allow them primacy over the animals and, and, and how they're managed and how they're sustained. And number two is federal land management gets in the way of not only on how those animals are managed, but on how they're used. What we're seeing across Alaska is since, since those original acres were set aside We've seen land management planning activities by federal agencies basically make much of that land that was multiple use into wilderness, into little w wilderness, they call it. But it's cutting off access. It's cutting off access to people that traditionally use those resources for subsistence. It's cutting across access for people that use them to, to travel across the landscape to hunt moose and, and caribou. So, yeah, it, it's the, the federal agencies are... are fundamentally changing the agreement that Alaska made at statehood over how those federal lands were going to be allowed to be used by the state of Alaska and how the wildlife and fish on them were going to be used. And we fight back. We remind them almost daily of, of those original commitments. Yeah, and I'm, what I'm trying to, one of the things that I want to get out of this is, so what kind of mechanism needs to or actions need to take place for for some productive, constructive hmm. conversations with the feds around around those issues. Well, it, it, be honest, it's hard, you know, because we fundamentally believe as a state 
that wildlife is managed for sustained yield and benefit. The federal government has a fundamental belief that wildlife should be managed for natural diversity. And, and I'm going to go back to the Kenai Peninsula a long time ago. So we're, we're managing bears in the Kenai Peninsula, grizzly bears. And the Kenai Peninsula is down in south of Anchorage. It's, it's, and it's a great big refuge down there, National Wildlife Refuge. And it was originally a moose um, what was it called? The Moose Range. The, mo the Moose Range. It was basically created by Congress to, to be a moose range to create moose for hunters. Well, when the refuge, it be, they changed it into a refuge. And the, and the primary factor that's driving the management of refuge is natural diversity. So everybody agreed, the state and federal government agreed, that at one time we had about 250 brown bears living down there, that that was too low. We wanted to get the population a little bit higher, around 500. So we eventually got the population to around 700, and people started feeling really unsafe in their communities with the number of grizzly bears walking through the community. So the state took steps to start getting the population under control. We didn't want it to grow much up higher than, than about 750 bears. So we entered into discussions with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who manages that refuge. And we asked them, what do you see as the, the target population for for brown bears on the Kenai Peninsula. And the gentleman looked across the table at me and says, whatever, nat whatever the nature can provide, sustain. I said, well, is, is that a thousand bears? He goes, whatever nature can provide, Doug. I said, is that 1,200 bears? Whatever nature can provide, Doug. I said, is that 1,500 bears? Doug, whatever nature can provide. That's not an answer on our behalf. That's not sustaining a functional ecosystem because we would have bears basically running through every village and everything. So we started active management of brown bears along the state lands that bordered the refuge. And the immediate response was back, you cannot, we, we not only need the, the, the refuge protected, we need buffer zones around the refuge so that you're not capturing our bears in the refuge. Again, I, I, at a fundamental level, we believe in functional ecosystems as providing sustained yield and benefit. And they believe in natural diversity, and that's a hard, hard one to 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 find agreement on. So we and and to be fair, their their mandates for the refuge system, natural diversity is one of about seven or eight different systems or things that they're supposed to be managing for. And part of those is, is benefits and sustained yield. They've chosen natural diversity as the primary one. I want to give Jason uh, final thoughts before he has to dash out to catch a plane. Um, priorities, final thoughts, what do you want to leave the governors that are watching this um, with? When it comes to water management, predictability is key. Investment is going to come to your states and to our states and to our nation if there is predictability in the rule of law. If we're constantly changing things from the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration, there is no predictability there. We all want to make sure our waters are protected and states are going to care more about their waters than the federal government ever will. And so having the durable, as the EPA is calling for, rule of the waters of the United States is imperative, but it needs to not be one that doesn't trust the states to do what they're already doing to protect their own waters. We don't need the federal government telling us how to do it. We do it pretty damn well here in Alaska. My final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, states can manage fish and game resources. We don't need federal oversight, and if we need it, we'll ask for it. So, right. I think we are fully capable, and we have a demonstrated history of, towards that end. And at the end of the day, fish and wildlife can provide a foundation for working, sustainable, functional ecosystems that provide community benefits. And Troy, if you'll indulge me, I will share my final thoughts too. And this is just around um, coordination, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that uh, intra-government and inter-government coordination is really 
critical in, in this modern time where we have just so much information available um, uh, to regulators, but it's, it's disproportionate. It, it's found in nooks and crannies and it, it's not all together. So when you bring a team of regulators together and the applicant that's making a proposal, and sometimes that applicant can be the federal agency that, uh, making a proposal, um, and you bring consultants into the mix and you, you actually get together and, and evaluate it through a team approach, um, and that's an iterative approach, the, the open communication, the building of trust, the understanding by the different parties of, of the project objectives, um, it gives value to the, uh, the process. The decisions that come out of that process are more informed. Uh, and it, it, it might not be faster necessarily, but it, it continues along a predictable path that everybody that is involved um, understands where they're at in the process. So I think that uh, Office of Project Management and Permitting, my office in Alaska is, is known for creating uh, that uh, team approach to permitting. I think the, the FIPSI is the federal example, um, and, and I, so I, I hope that that continues. Um, but I think Western states should look at uh, how their government silos are uh, operating and and look for those opportunities and you have to do it by design it doesn't happen by accident to work horizontally uh, across those uh, those silos and and in this panel today including myself you have uh, departments of environmental conservation fish and game and DNR so it's air water fish and wildlife and land and water use all represented and we work very very closely like a three-legged stool uh, to ensure that that resources are responsibly developed utilized and conserved in Alaska and I think it's it's a model that other western states could uh, could look to and in closing come on back next summer and fish yeah <laughs> you're all invited very good Troy anything else all right.